Today on the Johnny Kaberg Show, where did we come from? How did we get here? What brought us into existence? In most high schools and colleges, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is presented as an established fact of science rather than a theory. But today, many leading scientists in their peer review literature are rejecting Darwin's theory for many reasons. One of the most important being the Cambrian explosion of animals, where complex, fully formed animals suddenly just appeared in the fossil record with no prior ancestors before them. Why do some scientists believe that these animals present compelling evidence of an all-powerful designing intelligence in the history of life? My guest today is Dr. Stephen Meyer, who received his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge University as the author of the best-selling book, Darwin's Doubt. We invite you to join us. Welcome to our program. I'm John Inkerberg. Thanks for joining me. Our topic is, why are many scientists today rejecting the standard textbook theory of evolution known as neo-Darwinism? And where did the problems with the contemporary evolutionary theory begin? And Dr. Meyer, I'm really glad that you're here, and I want to start this program by asking you to explain how the fossil record poses a problem for Darwinian evolution. It actually poses two big problems. Right. Well, uh, we've been talking about a doubt that Darwin had about the adequacy of his own theory, its ability to explain all the evidence. And his doubt concerned a major event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion, in which the first major forms or first major groups of complex animals arose very abruptly in the fossil record. And this posed two problems, uh, two mysteries uh, uh, that were really un unresolved by Darwinian theory. The first I like to call the mystery of the missing fossils, because these animals appear very abruptly in the Cambrian layers, but as you go back into the lower pre-Cambrian strata, you don't find any evidence of the ancestral forms of those animals, the simpler forms that you would expect to find uh, according to Darwin's theory, because Darwin expected that the first complex forms of life would have emerged very gradually as a result of the accumulation of numerous slight variations or uh, changes uh, generation to generation. You just don't see, you see the, the accumulation of those changes in the lower strata. So that was a problem. That was a big problem. But there's an even more fundamental problem, and one that we've grown to appreciate in much more depth in the 20th century and 21st century. And that's essentially an engineering problem. How would the evolutionary process have built these complex forms of animal life, especially since they arose so abruptly in such a narrow window of geologic time? And that's, in, in my book, I look at both of those two mysteries, but the, more, the, the second mystery is more fundamental, and it's grown very much more acute because of things that we've discovered in modern biology since the, during the second half of the 20th century, since the 1950s. And uh, in particular, things that we've discovered about the information-bearing properties of living organisms and the information-bearing properties of the amazing molecule known as DNA. Yeah. When Crick and Watson came out with this discovery, what did they show us? Well, uh, Watson and Crick made the extraordinary discovery in 1953 that is, you know, world-renowned. It was this, they were able to elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. And they showed that the DNA molecule had this famed double helical structure with four chemicals running along the inside of that helix. And as most of us learn in biology class at some point, the DNA is a molecule that contains hereditary information, and it has a, a helical structure. And along the outside, there is this, this winding ladder, uh, double helix ladder, made of sh sugar and phosphate. On the inside of the molecule, there are these four chemicals called bases or nucleotide bases. And in 1957, four years after the structure was discerned, uh, Francis Crick put forward uh, I think what was one of the most important uh, hypotheses in the history of science. It's called the sequence hypothesis. And what Crick proposed was that these four chemicals that chemists re represent with the letters A, T, G, and C are actually functioning like alphabetic letters in a written text or like zeros and ones in a section of computer code. That is to say, it's not their chemical shape or structure that matters. What matters is the arrangement of those chemicals 
such that they are able to convey instructions for building all the important proteins and protein machines that keep cells alive. So what you have on the DNA molecule is literally digital code that is going to that provides instructions for building the, the, the crucial parts of cells that allow all life to exist. When you go down that spine, how much information is there? Well, in the, in the human genome, there's about three billion nucleotides. And even on a single, in a single one-celled organism, there is enough information to build a, a minimally complex one-celled organism requires about 500, 400, or 500 proteins. And that's going to compute to several hundred thousand uh, what are called base pairs or individual nucleotide letters in, in, that, in that genetic message. That all have to be arranged precisely. They have to be arranged precisely so that the instruction set will direct the construction of these proteins, these various kinds of proteins that are needed to keep cells alive. And proteins are essentially the toolbox of the cell that uh, some of them process information, some of them build structural parts, little miniature machines. We're discovering inside cells there are literally little tiny machines. There's a form of nanotechnology, sliding clamps and rotary engines and uh, robotic walking proteins. Um, and then some proteins catalyze reactions. These are the enzymes that we hear about. So proteins do all the jobs that keep cells alive and animals alive, but they, are only, they can only be built if the instruction set is right and that instruction set is stored on DNA. Even Bill Gates, when he looked at this, what did he say? Well, Bill Gates has, has said that DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever been able to create. And uh, many other, uh, many biologists have made similar uh, observations. Uh, uh, famed biotech uh, pioneer Leroy Hood has said very, very directly that DNA contains digital code. All right, explain how DNA relates to the Cambrian explosion and what we're talking about. Well, right, I, I used to ask my students a question, and, and if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And they'd say, well, code or instructions or software or information, and all of those are, are, are correct answers. And it turns out that the same thing is true in life. If you want to build a, a, a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form of life, you need new information, or rather, to put it more precisely, the evolutionary process would need to generate new information, new code. And that raises a big question. How does it do that? How would it do that? How could it do that? And one of the reasons that's such a big problem, a big, a big question, is that the mechanism, uh, the, the evolutionary mechanism, uh, the driving force of the evolutionary process is thought to be natural selection acting on random genetic mutation. Ch changes, random changes, in the arrangements of A, C's, G's, and T's, uh, the, the digital characters in the DNA molecule. Mm -hmm. But what we know from experience, uh, experience of computer code, for example, is that if you start making random changes to digital char characters in a message-bearing uh, sequence, you're going to degrade the information that's present in that sequence long before you're ever going to generate something fundamentally new and useful. I mean, just ask yourself a question if you're a computer programmer. If you've got a functioning computer program and you start randomly changing zeros and ones, are you going to generate a new program or operating system, or are you going to you're going to introduce glitches and bugs into the program you already have? Yeah. And and so there's there's something fundamentally um, disquieting from the standpoint of information science uh, about the idea that random changes in a functional section of code or text could generate something fundamentally new. And, and so that, that's been a, a, a kind of general concern that, that scientists have had about the creative power of the Darwinian mechanism. Can the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection and random mutation really generate new functional code? Because to build a new animal, you need new code. You need new DNA with, with, with digital information stored in those molecules. Programmed with this code. How do you explain the origin of the Cambrian animal seemingly out of nowhere? This isn't just a problem of explaining the absence of evidence in the fossil record. It's also a problem of explaining everything we know about life right down to the level of molecules and cells. The biological structure of a Cambrian trilobite was as complex and sophisticated as a modern crab. Its organs included a brain, gut, heart, and compound eyes. Each organ was constructed from specific types of cells. Each cell type was made from dozens of specialized protein molecules. 
and each protein was assembled from a four-letter chemical code in a section of DNA called a gene. Now, for the evolutionary process to transform a simple Precambrian organism like a sponge with four or five cell types into a Cambrian trilobite with at least 10 times that many different types of cells, that's a huge leap in complexity. And to make that leap, you need a vast amount of new genetic information. Where does that information come from? That's the central mystery of the Cambrian explosion. So, Dr. Meyer, help us understand this. Go back to this thing now of chance. I think Maureen at uh, Worcester Institute called a conference in the 1960s, and he was a mathematician, and he called evolutionary biologists, and he had people that were working on the atomic bomb. He had all kinds of scientists there, and he had a question that was bugging him. What was it? Well, Murray Eden was a computer scientist at MIT, and there was a picnic in uh, 1965 where the computer scientists and the physicists and the mathematicians and the engineers were, were talking with their biology colleagues over lunch. And all these scientists with mathematical training were expressing skepticism about the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism. They didn't believe that it could generate new genetic information uh, on the scale that was required to explain things like the Cambrian explosion. Um, and their, their main reason for thinking that was they realized that, that uh, uh, random changes in any, what they said, any formal language system will inevitably degrade meaning. 